So what I'm going to do over the next uh, 42 minutes is to talk a little bit about common pathology of the temporal bone, and we'll first talk a little bit about technique. Um, now, I assume everybody's got multi-detector CT. Uh, you know, at our institution, we've got uh, 64 slices. Anywhere from 4 to 64 is fine. Um, our CT, we do perform axial 0 0.625 millimeter thick sections. We obtain our acquisitions in the axial plane, and then what we do is reconstruct now. We reformat in the coronal plane, and we also look at the Stenvers and the Poshels view. So all of our uh, studies are, are now reconstructed in those coronal and parasagittal views. And this is the first, I still remember this, I still get cringe when I see this, but this is the first CT I ever read at UNC when I was a junior faculty. And it was literally my first day, and I was recruited by the ENT surgeons. Um, and they said, what do you think about this CT? And there were a lot of things wrong with this that I just didn't have the tenacity to fix yet. Uh, because I was used to very, very thin sections and so on and so forth. But when I looked at this, you know, it's a large field of view. It's bone windows, not bone algorithms. Um, and the slice thickness was two millimeters. And I said, well, there's a little soft tissue right here. I don't think there's any cholesteatoma, so on and so forth. And the head of ENT who recruited me there put his arm around me and said, you know, that was a huge cholesteatoma. It extended up into the middle cranial fossa. And oh, by the way, don't worry, you can't see ossicles on CT anyway. So that kind of pissed me off. So then what I did, <laughs> then what I did is I went to the technologist and, and re redid our protocols. And this really, is the type of imaging that you, you can get on your multi-detector imaging. And this year, we didn't do the normal temporal bone anatomy. I'll probably redo it next year where I step everyone through it. But just to um, give a couple highlights, here's the cochlea apical in the middle turn. Here's the modiolus cochlear canal. Here's the uh, canal for the superior vestibular nerve. There's the vestibule anterior and posterior cruise of the stapes. Here's the lenticular process of the incus the maneuver of the malleus. Now that's a fair amount of detail, but you can see all this stuff if you do your technique just right. In fact, this is the tensor tympani, and with a leap of faith, there's the, the little cochleiform process. But the point is, is that all of this anatomy, you can see if you do your technique just right. So before I would suggest you even contemplate really delving into your temporal bone about the pathology, a lot of the stuff that, that I'll be showing you um, is going to be only visible if you do the right technique. So, if, especially your residents or fellows, the first thing to do is learn your anatomy and make sure if you're a staff uh, member somewhere, optimize your technique. I, I can't emphasize that as much. So now all of our studies are reconstructed in the partial and a Stenvers view. And this really harkens back to the day of conventional tomography. So, you know, radiologists, we don't get older, we get more experienced. Are there any, any experienced radiologists in here besides myself? Right, so you remember the days of conventional tomography. And in conventional tomography, the planes that we used to use were the Poshels and Stenvers view. And you know what's new is old and what's old is new, right? And then all of a sudden, with the understanding that you can't have dehiscence of the superior semicircular canal, um, and you can, are best seen these in planes that are parallel and orthogonal to the superior semicircular canal, all of a sudden the Poshels and Stenvers view were were rediscovered. So, and you know, in our practice, it's one of the common reasons we do get temporal bone CTs is to look for superior semicircular canal. And again, with the reconstructions we now perform, it's, it's quite easy to do. You know, I won't spend too much time on uh, IAC, MRI. I think everyone at your institution is doing it and is doing it quite well. Just to reiterate, just cover the full course of the eighth nerve. Make sure your slice thickness is not greater than three millimeters. Um, always perform pre-contrast T1. We do post-contrast the axial and coronal plane. Um, and th don't forget, uh, there are other causes. You know, for me, a head and neck radiologist, I can get tunnel vision. I just start looking at the IAC and looking for vestibular schwannoma. But there are other things that can cause hearing loss, surprisingly enough. Um, and this is occurring in the accessory organ called the brain. Um, because for me, every organ is an accessory organ to the neck. You know, like the chest and the brain are accessory organs to the neck. So there are some incidental lesions that involve accessory organs that can cause hearing loss, things like strokes um, or multiple sclerosis too. So um, just remember to take a look at the brain real quickly and make sure you don't think have MS causing hearing loss. Uh, we now routinely perform the heavily weighted T2 weighted imaging through the internal auditory canal. And when you do this, you can really see the anatomy very, very nicely. So we all remember there are four nerves in the internal auditory canal. 
The anterior superior one, uh, remember seven up coke down, right? I don't know if you still learn that as resonance or not. But the seventh nerve is anterior and superior. So here's the facial nerve. This is the labyrinthine segment. There's the anterior genu, geniculate ganglion, and the heavily weighted T2 weighted images. There is the facial nerve here. And on this coronal image, this is posterior, this is anterior, so it's a sagittal view. There's our facial nerve. At the same level of the facial nerve is one of the vestibular nerves, and that's the superior vestibular nerve. So here it is on the axial plane, and then here it is on the parasagittal plane. Beneath the seventh nerve, i.e. coke down, is the cochlear nerve. So here's our cochlear nerve heading through the cochlear canal, extending into the modiolus. And when we look on the heavily two two weighted images, there's our cochlear nerve, which is located inferiorly. And then the inferior vestibular nerve is posterior inferiorly, as is seen here on the sagittal images and seen here um, on the, uh, and the axial images as well. Now this little thickening of the ganglion right here, that's actually Scarpa's ganglion. So we're getting to the point now where not, we can see Scarpa's ganglion. Now uh, for vestibular schwannomas, I think uh, we now do the heavily T2 weighted images routinely. And we can see vestibular schwannomas. Uh, you just look for replacement of the normal CSF. This is a parasagittal view here. In this case, all of the CSF is replaced by a vestibular schwannoma, and this is more the size of a rock. However, these very, very small vestibular schwannomas, I would argue you can probably see better with these very, very thin section T2 weighted images, because on a bad day, it's possible you could miss that. But I would argue on the heavily T2 weighted images, you'll be able to see these two millimeter uh, schwannomas easier on these images as opposed to the contrast enhanced studies. Now, you know what, you, you guys probably figure out, like, I dig head and neck radiology. Like, I love it. I want all of you to become a head and neck radiologist. Nothing would make me happier. And forget about all the other accessory organs of the body. Uh, and so the way that we learned uh, the temple bone in the cochlea in medical school is through histology textbooks. So we would learn the apical turn, the middle turn, and the basilar turn. We'd learn about the interscalar septum that essentially provided, if you will, this bosylated appearance to the cochlea. The channel of the cochlea is separated by the basilar membrane into a scala uh, vestibuli and a scalar tympani. And eventually, you have the, the organ of corti. Well, this is the way on the right we learned in medical school through these histologic specimens where we see the basilar membrane. But now, when you do your T2-weighted images on the, on the 3T system, we can start seeing a lot of this anatomy that we could only see on histology. So in fact, here's our apical turn. Here's our middle turn. Here's our basilar turn. We can see the inner scalar septum here, and lo and behold, there is the basilar membrane right here, separating into the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. We haven't gone down yet to the organ of corti, but we're getting pretty close. Now, having said that, we're actually now to the point where we can see the macula of the utricle. So when we talk about imbalance problems, the way we balance ourselves is through the, the um, various otoliths, uh, et cetera, and these are located in the saccule and the utricle. And now, when we do our heavily weighted T2 weighted images just right, you can actually see this little area of increased signal within the vestibule. And you can see this in three planes. And years ago, we actually described the normal morphology. And these are just you know one millimeter, two millimeter thicknesses involving the macula and the utricle. And we're able to see that on our T2 weighted images. OK, so that's our technique. And, and we talked a little bit about the anatomy. And now let's go through some common pathology that you'll be seeing. And I'll take uh, the remainder of the time to, again, really try to focus on the applied anatomy since we didn't have a dedicated anatomy lecture this year. So um, otosclerosis is actually a unique disease of the otocapsule. And no one's really quite sure what causes it. Um, they say there is some genetic predisposition, primarily autosomal dominant a little bit more common in females and males, and it's bilateral up to 60%. Now, otosclerosis is felt to be due to abnormal resorption and deposition of bone in the middle ear cavity. Otosclerosis is still a clinical diagnosis. Um, now, having said that, I think radiologically, we see little deposits of otosclerosis now uh, than before. In fact, if you go back and read Shutnik's book, um, he described otosclerosis in 10% of the quote unquote, asymptomatic population. Um, having said that, some otologists just won't get CTs before performing surgery. So I'm going to break from the script, right? So 
uh, this one guy I play basketball with every Sunday morning, he's an otologist, and he works at Michigan Ear, right? So one of the other guys I play basketball has known otosclerosis. So my buddy, the otologist, decides to perform a stapedectomy on the other guy. And I'm like, you know, why don't you get a CT scan to look to see if it's finesse or arrestor finesse? He says, yeah, it's not going to change what I do anyway. And this guy is young. I mean, if he was my age and was an old fart, I'd say, all right, you can't, you know, teach an old dog new tricks. But, you know, the guy's like in his late 30s, and he's been operating for, you know, a few years, but he just won't change what he does. So he still believes that otosclerosis is primary, primarily a clinical diagnosis based on classic audiological findings. So what do we say radiologically? Well, on the right here is an illustration from Shetnick's book, the classic book, and this is what we see on CT. So this axial image was taken through the level of the oval window, anterior and posterior, and what we see at the most anterior aspect of the oval window is a region here called the fistula anafinestrum. And the fistula anafinestrum is supposed to be the first area of the deposition or the creation of otosclerosis. So on this histologic specimen, and obviously in a different patient, here is the oval window, and this is the fistula anafinestrum. So the first place that you look for is a little bit of rarefaction right here in the fistula anafinestrum, the most anterior portion of the oval window. Now, because this deposition occurs in the window, this is what's referred to as fenestral otosclerosis. So when I'm looking at a temporal bone, potentially for otosclerosis, that's where my eye goes to. So that's the, the approach. So if you have fenestral, then you could have retrofenestral. And what's retrofenestral? Retrofenestral is essentially this resorption of bone along the pericochlea. Uh, 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 these, these are what we refer to as the peri cochlear lucencies. So because it's below the oval window or deep to the oval window, this is why it's called retrofenestral otosclerosis. Now, back here when I went over this, there's something called the Schwartz sign. And this was a classic clinical finding associated with otosclerosis. The Schwartz sign is probably due to when you have retrofenestral otosclerosis leading to increased vascularity involving the, the cochlea itself. Now, you can perform MR for this, and I have to admit, my sensitivity for picking up otosclerosis on MR um, is lacking from what has been reported in the literature. I know years ago, uh, there are many people in Europe that uh, felt that uh, MR was a good way of identifying retrofenestral otosclerosis. Uh, I haven't found it to be. Now, having said that, I always do check for cochlear enhancement in patients that come with unexplained hearing loss. But if you do uh, perform MR, what you look for is increased enhancement involving the cochlea um, following administration of gadolinium. But again, it sort of correlates to, uh, radiologically with the Schwartz sign. So what has been described most recently is the third window. So sometimes the classic teaching for otosclerosis is that you look at the fistula anafinestrum, and maybe with a leap of faith, we can see a little bit of rarefaction of bone. Then we have the pericochlear lucencies. But we are starting to see more and more areas of rarefaction along the petrous bone, the petrous apex. And this is what has been referred to as, if you will, the third window. And you know, we started seeing this, and lo and behold, I went back and I have Shutnik's book you know, that was 60 years old, and when he did his when he did his histologic specimens, he did describe rarefaction of bone in the petrous apex along the internal auditory canal. So if you see something like this along the IAC and you think, well, maybe it's a little fibrous dysplasia or, or something unusual, that's actually otosclerotic deposits that have, been, uh, uh, have, that have been described. And if you wait long enough, or theoretically you wait long enough, it can eventually cavitate. And sometimes this is a term that's been given to cavitary otosclerosis. So this is sometimes what's referred to as a third window for otosclerosis. Well, let's move on now and talk a little bit about labyrinthitis. So what exactly is labyrinthitis? Labyrinthitis is pure and simply an information of the membranous labyrinth. Then there's an acute phase and there's a chronic phase. So the acute phase of labyrinthitis has been classified by the bug, and the bugs can be bacterial, viral, syphilitic, fungal, toxic, or autoimmune, or it can be characterized by the route of spread. And that route of spread can be from the middle ear, tympanogenic, from the brain, meningogenic, bloodborne, or post-traumatic. So again, depending on what you read, there are different ways to classify labyrinthitis. So what is the different types of labyrinthitis? Well, acute labyrinthitis, pure and simply, as is seen here on your right from Shutnick's book, 
is just pus in the cochlea. It's just an acute inflammation in the cochlea. And again, a lot of what we see in the head and neck can be seen elsewhere in the body. It's the same, pathologically, it's the same disease process. It's just that when it occurs in the head and neck, we start to get palpations and nervous because it's the head and neck, right? I don't know if you all feel that way, but I feel that way sometimes. But if you just remember the basic principles and apply it to the head and neck, then things kind of make sense. So what would you see if you had an inflammation anywhere else in the body? You would end up seeing abnormal enhancement, right, anywhere else in the body. And that's what you see in acute labyrinthitis. So the pathophysiology is that you have pus and acute inflammation in the cochlea. And so what we would see on MR is abnormal enhancement of the cochlea on the involved side compared to the opposite side. Also, we can make some type of, uh, uh, I don't know, guess, I don't think guess is the right word, but we can make an assumption here that, look at this, the cause of the cochlea here, the, the cause of this is due to tympanogenic cause of labyrinthitis. You see all this abnormal enhancement in the middle ear cavity? So the cause of this acute labyrinthitis is probably due to direct spread from the middle ear. So this would be tympanogenic labyrinthitis. Now, what's obliterative labyrinthitis? or sometimes referred to as labyrinthitis ossificans. So the way that I think about it, and again, a lot of what I do is trying to conceptualize things, because if I can conceptualize it, it makes it easier to understand. So if you continue to cut yourself, and, you, and your cut never heals, you eventually develop a scar, right? So what happens in labyrinthitis ossificans, or obliterative labyrinthitis, is that if you have acute labyrinthitis, and it's persists for a long time or it's never properly treated, your body has to react in a certain way. And the way that it reacts in your inner ear is that you have the deposition of fibrosseous material and eventually sclerosis. So you can see on this histologic section about how these normal channels within the cochlea uh, become replaced by this fibrosseous matrix. And this can be fibrosseous tissue or it can eventually go on for frank sclerosis. So what we see here radiologically is here's the internal auditory canal, here's the cochlear canal, and I think I can convince you with a leap of faith there's something in here replacing the cochlea. So this is what's referred to as obliterated, obliterated, obliteration of the labyrinth or labyrinthitis ossificans with deposition of ossific material. Similarly, if you look at the vestibule, the vestibule should be back here. It should have the same attenuation as the IAC, but we can see that has been replaced too with this increased attenuation. So again, labyrinthitis ossificans. The most common location to look for labyrinthitis ossificans is in the basal turn of the cochlea. That's what's been described for the first location. So your eye should first go to the basal turn. But eventually, if it's untreated, it can go ahead and involve the apical and the middle turns. And this is just an, another example of very severe labyrinthitis ossificans. On the right-hand side, complete replacement of the cochlea in the vestibule. On the CT scan, you can't even see the cochlea and a little bit of the vestibule. And on the heavily T2 weighted images, here's the internal auditory canal. Remember, the inner ear of the labyrinth contains fluid, right? And you should have fluid here, but there's no fluid at all because it's been replaced with the ossific and fibrosseous material. The next thing that we want to talk about is if you will, take a, a somewhat clinical approach and, and say, well, what happens if someone comes in, or what do we look for if someone has a red retrotympanic mass, or a little red mass you know, behind the tympanic membrane? So the otologist may see this, and they think of different things that it could be. And our job as a radiologist is to be familiar with what may occur. So the first thing that we'll look at is a glomus tympanicum. So this thing could be caused by a glomus tympanicum tumor. So what's the glomus tympanicum? So Dr. Salam and I both talked about glomus tumors. And essentially, a glomus tumor that arises in the middle ear cavity is a glomus tympanicum tumor if it's isolated to the middle ear. So here we have this well-defined soft tissue mass that's located on this prominence of the cochlea, hence the term cochlear promontory. On the axial images, again, we see a, a soft tissue mass. Now, this could be cholesteatoma. It very well could be, but we cannot say radiologically, and we'll see why later. But this in of itself is a differential diagnosis. But if, the, if they say a retrotympanic mass and we see a focal soft tissue mass along the cochlear promontory, then we have to consider glomus tympanicum. 
Here's another example of a Glomus tympanicum. Again, right along the cochlear promontory. The glomus tympanicum is associated with this nerve right here, which forms a lot, which runs along the cochlear promontory, and it's a branch of cranial nerve nine. Does anybody remember the name of that nerve? It starts with a J. Jacobson's nerve, right? Dr. Sam earlier mentioned Arnold's nerve, which is a branch of cranial nerve ten. Jacobson's is a branch of cranial nerve nine, and here we have this mass right here on the cochlear promontory, pretty typical location for a glomus tympanicum. You can perform CT or MR. Um, here's a CT again demonstrating glomus tympanicum. And on MR, glomus tympanicum is typically densely enhanced with contrast. So here's a coronal imaging demonstrating the known hypervascularity of a glomus tympanicum tumor. So, you know, why do we do MR? Again, from a value added standpoint. If you say to the, the surgeon and they say, well, you know, I can see that little red retrotympanic mass and I think it's a glomus tympanicum, you know, they, they very well may be right. But occasionally what will happen, it will be the whole tip of the iceberg phenomena. Because if they see a red retrotympanic mass, occasionally this will be a glomus tympanicum that also has a significant component of the tumor extending into the jugular foramen. And that's what's referred to as a glomus jugular tympanicum. So typically with small tympanicums, they can just go in and literally pick off, pick off the, uh, the glomus tumor. If they tried to do that here, uh, it's not going to be happy because you can see this thing is uh, growing deeply and eroding the skull base. So that's another thing we have to look for, obviously. See that mass, but no, make sure there's no deep extension. Another example of a, a glomus jugular tympanicum, this is in the middle ear cavity, and we can see all this ex disease extending deeply. The one point I want to mention, too, is that here's a normal jugular bulb on the uninvolved side, and look at the jugular bulb on the involved side. The jugular bulb is enlarged, and we have this permeative bone appearance. This, on the other hand, is a pure glomus jugulari. Here's a normal jugular bulb on the right side. And look on the left side. What are we missing here? What tells you there's something else going on? The absence of what? Yeah. See on the left-hand side, see this nice corticated bone here? See how that bone is all eroded in that permeate appearance? That tells you that is not right. And again, like in the head and neck, you have a pretty good comparator to the opposite side. So if you're not sure, just look to the opposite side. And when we perform the MR, here's a pre-contrast and a post-contrast enhanced T1 weighted images. This is a glomus jugulari. So the glomus tumors that are just purely limited to the jugular foramen that arise from the superior cervical ganglion, this is a glomus jugulari. And then when we look internally, we see these black dots right here, which are what? Flow voids, exactly right. So that's where the flow voids come into place. So we talked about glomus tympanicums, glomus jugulotympanicums, and glomus jugularis, all of things that, uh, two of those things can cause a retrotympanic mass. Well, the other thing that can cause a retrotympanic mass is the persistence to pedial artery. And again, I didn't really understand this. It took me a while. But here's the deal with persistence to pedial arteries. In fact, Hugh Curtin and I were talking about this ad nauseum last week. In order to have a persistence to pedial artery, it has to be attached to the middle meningeal artery. So you can have a barren vessels running in the middle ear cavity, but the only way we can say it's a persistent stapedial if it gives rise to the middle meningeal artery. So normally what happens is that there's this hyoid artery which eventually has an upper and lower division. Over time, this segment that runs through the stapes becomes uh, resorbed. And essentially this component ends up translocating to the external carotid artery which eventually gives rise to the middle meningeal. But what happens in a persistent stapedial artery is that this artery this hyoid artery persists and then gives rise to the middle meningeal artery. So that's the true definition of a middle meningeal artery. And because this is running in the middle ear cavity, you could see how this artery could give you a red retrotympanic mass. So what we look for on CT are a couple of things. First of all, because the middle meningeal normally arises from the external carotid artery. So it has to get through the skull base. And the way that it gets through the skull base is through this foramen, which is what? Foramen spinosum. So on this side, there's absence of foramen spinosum. The next thing that we have to see is once we see this artery, we can't say for sure that this is a persistent stapedial artery unless we can see it's attached to the middle meningeal artery. So we have to follow the artery out 
or perform an angiogram or an MRA just to be sure. So we can say it may be in a barren vessel, but it can only be a persistent sepedial artery if it gives rise to the middle meningeal. And one more example here, here's a persistent stapedial artery, and this little vessel right here, there should be no artery on the cochlear promontory at all. It should be nice, smooth, and bony. So again, in this particular case, another abnormal vessel, this was attached to the middle meningeal artery, so again, a persistent stapedial artery. So the first thing we look for are retrotympanic tumors, like a glomus tumor. Then we want to make sure there's no persistent stapedial artery. And then the third thing, is the aberrant carotid artery. And I think all of you in the room are familiar with the aberrant carotid artery, again, presenting as a retrotympanic mass. So how does the embryology work? You know, embryology is fascinating to me. It's, it's, it's uh, quite amazing. So in the normal area, we have the internal carotid artery coming up. It pierces the skull base. And we can have a branch right here that's referred to as the inferior tympanic artery that eventually goes through the inferior tympanic canaliculus. What happens in an aberrant carotid artery is that this segment of the internal carotid artery from here to here becomes resorbed or it never forms. Well, eventually the brain needs blood. It's got to get it from somewhere. So what ends up happening is that this inferior tympanic artery becomes the route of blood flow to the brain. So this inferior tympanic artery now anastomoses with this carotidotympanic artery so now you have, if you will, this collateral pathway. So what ends up happening is instead of having this direct communication, we end up having this aberrant course with this little acute turn. And that mimics the pathophysiology or the embryology, if you will, of the development of the inferior tympanic artery and the hyoid artery. So what we typically see is this aberrant course. There's typically bony dehiscence, and we can see the carotid artery extending into the middle ear cavity. Again. Here's the MRA normal on the left side, and here's this aberrant course on the involved side. So the three things we have to look for when we see the retrotympanic mass are the glomus tumors involving the skull base, the persistent stapedial artery, and the aberrant carotid artery. These can be indistinguishable on otoscopic exam. Well, the next thing that we'll talk about is mastoiditis. And with mastoiditis, <coughs> what we have to look for is um, be careful, again, and when you're looking at that, that accessory organ of the brain, uh, just be careful if you ever see this unilateral effusion. So you can have this unilateral effusion, and you have to make sure when you see this that we look at the nasopharynx, because the earliest formation of nasopharyngeal carcinoma is if we see an early nasopharyngeal carcinoma in the fossa of Rosenmuller. Very, very subtle T1 lesion. And why does that result in a unilateral effusion? The reason is, is that there's a channel that communicates the back of the pharynx with the middle ear, and that's the eustachian tube. And if this tumor ends up pushing or invading the torus tubarius, since the opening of the eustachian tube is right here and right here, that can occlude that eustachian tube, and you develop a unilateral effusion. So anytime that you see unilateral serous otitis or unilateral effusion, you, your eye has to go to the nasopharynx to make sure there's no early nasopharyngeal carcinoma. If this is untreated or it becomes effect, infected, this can eventually go on to erode some of the fine bony labyrinth of the mastoid air cell, and this is what's referred to as coalescent mastoiditis. Now, I'm going to show a couple of cases of cholesteatoma later that can have a similar appearance. So radiologically, you can have overlap, but remember, diagnoses such as mastoiditis are not radiological diagnosis, they're clinical diagnosis. It's pain and tenderness over the, the mastoid tip. So with us, we can be uh, descriptive, but we have to be careful about making this diagnosis without the relevant clinical history. But having said that, what we look for is erosion of the fine labyrinthine bone of the mastoid air cells. If this goes untreated, this can go on and erode the inner cortex and the inner table of the petrous bone, resulting potentially in dural sinus thrombosis. So if this is a patient that went on to develop dural sinus thrombosis, from a coalescent mastoiditis. If this is untreated, it can again erode the outer cortex of the mastoid bone. Now, this was referred to um, currently as Bezel's abscess. Now, if you actually go back, and again, you can see what I do in my free time, right? So 
Frederick Bezel described Bezel's abscesses, I think it was in 1845 or something. And again, long before the days of CT and MR. And what he ended up doing was describing a complication of mastoiditis. But he specifically described this as an abscess involving the, uh, uh, the region just deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So if you're a purist, what a Bezel's abscess is, is coalescent mastoiditis that extends inferiorly and gives rise to an abscess in the neck. Now, uh, you know, we sort of change the definitions, and I've been to conferences where essentially any type of phlegmon or abscess formation that extends through the outer cortex of the mastoid uh, bone and involves the soft tissues in the region surrounding the ear or the perimastoid soft tissues is referred to as a Bezel's abscess. So um, if you go to conferences, sometimes you'll see this, but if you're a purist, uh, just realize a true Bezel's abscess involves the uh, deep neck musculature. And if it continues to go on worse and worse, you can have extension into the temporal lobe, and this is just a frank intracranial abscess. Well, the last thing that we'll end with is cholesteatoma. Now, cholesteatoma is probably the main reason that you perform CTs in your practice. And so I think it's important to learn a little bit about cholesteatomas from a pathophysiological standpoint. So the definition for cholesteatoma is keratinizing debris that arises from the desquamation of the squamous epithelial lining. I have no idea what that means, and no clue, no clue. Essentially, I remember cholesteatoma as skin growing in the, in the wrong place. That's the way I remember it. So cholesteatomas can be congenital or they can be acquired. And we'll first talk about congenital cholesteatoma. The, the, if for congenital cholesteatomas are fundamentally a different process than acquired cholesteatomas. So congenital cholesteatomas are sometimes referred to as epidermoids. And there is no history of tympanic membrane perforation, and there's no history of middle ear infection. Whoops, sorry about that. Yeah, there we go. So this is an example of a congenital cholesteatoma. So we see this focal soft tissue mass here in the middle ear cavity. Now, what does the surgeon see, or the pediatric otologist, or the pediatrician? They look in the tympanic membrane and they see the retrotympanic white mass. Not the red mass, but the white mass, the pearly white mass. And the key thing here is that you see this soft tissue, it's separate from the cochlear promontory and clinically it's white. The other thing to point out, and this will become more pertinent in just a couple slides, is look at the mastoid bone. See how it's completely aerated? It looks beautiful, right? So whatever process is happening here, does not appear to be related or associated with the mastoid ear cell. So this is what we mean, a radiographic evidence that there's no history of another acquired ear infection. So uh, it's separate. So this is a congenital cholesteatoma. It's typically felt to be due uh, very close to the plane of the ossicles. And I've seen books both ways. Some people say it's deep to the plane of the ossicles. Some people say it's lateral. But for me, it's generally pretty close to the plane of the ossicles. Now, what's an acquired cholesteatoma? A fundamentally different disease. So an acquired cholesteatoma is, this is the way I think about it conceptually. So you know with our skin, right? You know, our skin is a, a very active organ. It's rapidly turning over, and there's a lot of desquamation that's coming off. So that's why you, know, you may go, I may get a pedicure, a manicure, whatever cure I get. You know, you do the you know, dermabrasion, right? You know? So what it is is to try to clean up your skin because it's rapidly turning over, right? So we have skin involving our external auditory canal. And so it's hard to think of it, but all that skin turnover in our, that's turning over in our ear has got to go somewhere, right? So it should go somewhere. And it's probably coming out of your ear. You may not want to think about that, but that's sort of what happens. So normally, your eustachian tube should be patent. So remember, the eustachian tube communicates with the back of your pharynx and it communicates with your middle ear. So there should be good patency with that. So as a result, the vectors from your middle ear cavity should be pointing outwards. So if you have the desquamation of the skin, the stuff should be going out, right? But on the other hand, if you have a chronic ear infection and you eventually go on to have obliteration of the eustachian tube, this is what's referred to as eustachian tube dysfunction. So essentially what happens there is that the vectors are reversed, and now it's coming internally like this. So instead of all the stuff going out, this can come internally like this. 
Now, once it comes internally, it's going to run into this structure right here, which is what? The tympanic membrane. Now, how many parts of the tympanic membrane are there? It's two parts, right? Anybody remember the names of them? There's a pars something and the pars something. Pars flas and the pars tensa, exactly right. So the pars tensa, uh, it really comprises the majority of the tympanic membrane, but there is this flaccid part, which is located in the superior portion of the tympanic membrane. And if indeed the vectors are reversed, the sucking sound, this negative vector, starts to have the greater influence on the flaccid part of the tympanic membrane. And this is what's referred to as the invagination theory of acquired cholesteatomas. So as the sucking sound comes in, the part flaccida starts to become, guess what, retracted. And this is what's referred to as a retraction pocket. Now, if the vectors continue and you form this retraction pocket, it can eventually get filled in with a bunch of junk, all that squamous debris, et cetera. And what do you think the space is called right here that's located in the lateral epitympanic recess? Take a wild guess. Prusak space. Yeah, it's not the masticator space. It's a Prusak space, right? So that's where Prusak space is. So if you ever wondered why it's felt that cholesteatomas arise in Prusak space, that's why. Because the vectors are reversed, and the pars flaccida is along the superior aspect of the tympanic membrane, and this is what gets retracted into this area here. And if it goes unabated, all of the epitympanum can eventually become filled with cholesteatoma. So this is a pathologically proven case of a retraction pocket. We can see the soft tissue mass. Here's our sputum. Here's the malleus. And we can see the soft tissue mass right here. And on the axial images, that's a retraction pocket. Could this be early cholesteatoma? Sure. But we can't, be, we can't say for sure. But how can we make the diagnosis of cholesteatoma? For us as radiologists to make the diagnosis of cholesteatoma, it's, it's, it's an equation. We have to see a focal soft tissue mass associated with some type of bone or ossicular erosion. So if we see a focal soft tissue mass and there's no erosion, it could still be a cholesteatoma, but we cannot say that as a radiologist. But on the other hand, if we see a focal soft tissue mass associated with ossicular erosion, then we can make the diagnosis. So in this particular case, here's our soft tissue mass. Here's the manubrium of the malleus. We should see another dot right here. This is what I call the two dot level. And what would that dot be here? Anybody? The long process of the incus, exactly right. And then on the axial images, this is the level of the ice cream cone. So here's the head of the malleus. And what should comprise this portion of the ice cream cone? What process of the incus? Anybody? Short process of the incus. So notice how that's absent. So there's our equation. Soft tissue mass plus ossicular erosion, cholesteatoma. Another example here, cholesteatoma. But look at it, a large mass here, and notice how there's erosion of this bone right here. Anybody remember the name? It's, it's, name, it's a septum, starts with a K. Kerner septum, exactly right. So notice how Kerner septum is eroded along with all the other fine labyrinthine bone. Now if you have a really sharp eye, you can also see the cholesteatoma here, and look what's happening to the long press of the incus. It bec it's becoming demineralized. And some people claim that the earliest sign of cholesteatoma is demineralization of the long process of the incus. I still have residents and other folks tell me, well, the sputum was intact. Um, this, for me, the sputum erosion is a very, very late finding. And sometimes I wonder, I, I, just, I just wonder the reason why the sputum uh, became um, associated with cholesteatoma is I just wonder if that's the one reliable finding that you could see on conventional tomography. Because when we look at a conventional tomography, we had to have consistent landmarks. So the sputum was pretty easily seen. But now that we have CT, we can pick up earlier bone erosion or ossicular erosion before the sputum is eroded. So for me, I actually rarely see sputum or sputal erosion. I see ossicular erosion much more commonly than I see sputum erosion. So if you have a soft tissue mass, you're not sure, and you say, well, the sputum's intact, so it can't be cholesteatoma, um, I don't think that's a very reliable way to exclude cholesteatoma. What about on MR? It, cholesteatomas tend to be high signal or intermediate signal on T1 and do not enhance with contrast. And you know, we routinely, although I'd love to as a chair of a department, I'd love to get MRs on every cholesteatoma that came through, but it's really, it's really not indicated. Um, but what can be helpful is this, and I think this is gaining greater acceptance in the otology literature, is that if you do have a patient that's undergone multiple ear surgeries, and normally you get a temporal bone CT, and 
It can be challenging, there's no doubt about it, especially if you don't have history. But if you do have a patient that has multiple surgeries and we start seeing this mass here and we're not sure what it is, then I think diffusion imaging certainly can be helpful. So there's a little bit of increased signal here and there's the restricted ADC. If you go and read the literature, and I agree with the literature on this, the best diffusion technique to use is line scan diffusion. And really only one of the vendors offers this, I think, on their off-the-shelf product. There are other vendors that have diffusion but not line scan. So at our institution, we don't have the vendor that offers line scan diffusion, but we still perform diffusion imaging. And I think, Kevin, would you agree? We get, it's, it's not a bad way to look at it. it may, yeah, we can still see it. It's not as good as a line scan, but when you have these um, very complex cases with multiple surgeries, uh, we routinely do perform diffusion, and we do find it, um, it helpful in, in, in particular cases. So in summary, what I've tried to do is to go over the technique, a little bit of temporal bone. We talked about the anatomy. And just to review the pathology we went over. Remember, otosclerosis, fenestral, retrofenestral in the third window. We talked about acute and chronic labyrinthitis, right? These three things were for the red retrotympanic mass. And we talked about glomus tympanicum, glomus jugular tympanicum, and glomus jugulari. We talked about persistent stapedial artery, the aberrant carotid artery, mastoiditis and its complications, and we ended with cholesteatoma. 